Good morning. I know I said I wasn't going to do a show today, but I'm kind of an addict, so I kind of have to be here. So, yeah, today we're going to go over some good stuff. Today, what we're going to do is we are going to cover another chapter from my book. Uh, if you are interested in acquiring a couple more chapters from my book, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash jfkbook and pre-order my upcoming ebook, which comes with four chapters and my complete notes and access to my private Telegram chat. So, buymeacoffee.com slash jfkbook. Today, we're going to talk about three of the more important people involved in the assassination, particularly Lawrence Howard, William Seymour, Lauren Hall, the three men paramount in establishing the Oswald legend in Dallas. So, without further ado, let me begin. Three of the more central characters in the assassination are also the three who attract the least amount of attention. The names of William Seymour, Lauren Hall, and Lawrence Howard are scattered throughout the assassination literature. However, their importance in the events leading up to and including November 22nd, 1963 has largely been overlooked. When people discuss this nefarious trio, it is usually in regards to their involvement with Interpen or the Intercontinental Penetration Force. Interpen was the creation of a man named Jerry Hemming, but it was supported and financed by the CIA. They were responsible for the organization of training camps for the anti-Castro-Cuban exiles and other mercenaries for the purpose of carrying out raids in Cuba. The camp on the north side of Lake Pontchartrain, often associated with David Ferry's anti-Castro activities, was set up and run by Hemming's Interpen Group. According to Spartacus Educational, Interpen was involved in training members of the anti-Castro groups funded by the Central Intelligence Agency in Florida in the early 1960s. When the government began to crack down on raids from Florida in 1962, Interpen set up a new training camp in New Orleans. During this period, Hemming was arrested by customs for gun running, but the charges were later dismissed. Interpen was a nexus of CIA agents, private contractors, and anti-Castro Cubans. Some of the names associated with Interpen are Roy Hargraves, Dick Watley, Ronald Augustinovich, Edmund Colby, Ralph Schlafter, and Edwin Collins. Lauren Hall, Lawrence Howard, and William Seymour, however, were the most significant and impactful members of this group as it pertains to the assassination of JFK. Lauren Hall was your typical gung-ho right-wing anti-communist mercenary type. He stood at 5 foot 11 inches tall, weighed around 200 pounds with jet black hair. He often claimed to be a Cuban using the name of Lorenzo Pasillo, but in reality, he was born in Newton, Kansas in 1930. Hall had joined the Marines in mid-1950s. By 1959, he was a captain in Castro's Revolutionary Army. Hall had become involved in a plot to overthrow Anastasio Somoza de Bile, the Nicaraguan dictator. However, he and others were caught and arrested by the Cuban government. Hall served six months in a Cuban jail cell. Quote, also in prison at this time was Santos Traficante Jr., on July 8, 1959, Castro deported three Americans, Traficante Hall and Henry Savadra, a former employee of the Capri Hotel in Havana, which was reportedly run by a syndicate including Traficante and Charlie the Blade Torrain. In 1961, Hall moved to California where he set up his personal base of operations for his anti-Castro activities. However, in 62 to 63, he was associated with elements of the no-name key group of CIA agents and anti-Castro guerrillas in southern Florida. It is known that Traficante made contacts with some of the no-name key group members and may have funded some of its operations. Hall often attempted to solicit money under the guise of the Cuban rebel army. However, others who ran in the same circles as Hall believed this was a scheme to pocket the cash. Hall had traveled the country in the early 1960s giving speeches to various right-wing groups, including the John Birch Society and the Minutemen. He often traveled with, quote, Mexican Larry Howard. Jerry Hemming and William Seymour, according to an FBI informant within Interpen. Despite his numerous attempts at creating an alibi for November 22, 1963, Hall was most certainly in Dallas. Hall is inextricably linked to the assassination where I place him on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, firing shots from the west side window. His weapon of choice, a Johnson 30-06 rifle, which he had picked up from a man named Richard Hathcock in Los Angeles. Quote, other documents released by the ARRB discuss a Johnson semi-automatic 30 6 rifle that was apparently found in Dealey Plaza soon after the shooting. The documents strongly link this rifle to two men who have long been suspected of being involved in the assassination plot, Lauren Hall and Jerry Patrick Hemming. Lauren Hall and an unidentified Hispanic man took the weapon about a week before the assassination. 
Hall himself told Hathcock, the California owner of the rifle, five days prior to the assassination, that he had to catch a flight to Dallas. In the months leading up to the assassination, Lauren Hall and Jerry Hemming, who'd been using the name Jerry Patrick, met with Hathcock at the offices of his private detective business in Los Angeles, Allied International Detectives. He had become associated with these men through the relationship with Dick Watley, who had introduced the pair to Hathcock. Hathcock told investigators that he had loaned the men $100 in exchange for a set of golf clubs and a Johnson 30-06 rifle with a Bushnell scope. An FBI memo written by S.A. Jerome K. Crow detailing a conversation with Hathcock about Hall and Hemming was dated November 23, 1963, the day after the assassination. The implication of this date is that the FBI knew about this rifle immediately after Kennedy was killed, whether through fingerprints or by tracing the serial number or an act of psychic phenomenon. The FBI was able to obtain the full backstory to the rifle less than 24 hours after the president had been shot. The statements made by Hathcock indicated that Hall had picked up the rifle from him on September 17th or 18th, 1963, and that five days before Kennedy was killed, Hall had told him he was on his way to Dallas. Hathcock told authorities, quote, they wanted to borrow the $100, and what they had for security was a set of golf clubs and a rifle, which was a 30 caliber Johnson, modified to semi-automatic operation, which I believed held nine rounds and was also equipped with a Bushnell variable scope. I gave them the $100, and they left the clubs and the rifle. For several weeks after that, I saw both men frequently. Then my understanding was that Jerry Patrick returned to Miami to set things in operation down there for a planned invasion of Cuba. What they had planned, essentially, was to blow up some oil storage tanks on the West Coast. Lorenzo Hall stayed there uh, and was in the private eye office very often, almost every day. He told me that he and Patrick had originally been in Castro's army when they believed that he was trying to free Cuba from Batista, found out he was a communist, had no interest in the people, and they turned on Castro with the result that they were both imprisoned and sentenced to be shot. Both through manipulations and through friends managed to escape and get to this country. Hall and Hemming were the real deal. Both were contract agents for the CIA involved heavily with the anti-Castro Cuban uh, movement and the various organizations that surrounded them at the time. After the Bay of Pigs incident, it seems as though many of these militia types were lost. They were angry at both Kennedy and the CIA. Many of them found their way to New Orleans, Dallas, Los Angeles, and other cities that had a heavy intelligence influence where they could find work. Although many researchers put Hemming in Dallas on November 22nd, the evidence of his involvement in the assassination is minimal at best. Hemming claims that he was in Miami at the time Kennedy was killed. Other than a photograph of a man slightly resembling Hemming standing in Dealey Plaza wearing a gray business suit and one potential witness, I haven't seen anything concrete that would make me feel comfortable naming Hemming as one of the plotters. The potential witness to Hemming's presence was a man named Philip Ben Hathaway. He and a man named John Stevens Rudder Lawrence were walking near Main and Ackard in downtown Dallas just prior to the assassination when they saw a man carrying what they believed to have been a rifle case. Quote, I saw this man walking towards me, walking towards commerce, and took particular attention to him because of his size. I am 6'5 and weigh 200 pounds. This man was very tall, approximately 6'6 or 6'7, over 250 pounds, very thick and big throughout the chest in his 30s, dirty blonde hair worn in a crew cut, was wearing a gray colored business suit with white dress shirt, fair complexion. I remarked to my friend that there was a guy carrying a gun in all this crowd and made the remark that he was probably a secret service man. Other than this description by Hathaway, which matches Hemming to a T, and a photo of a similarly gray-suited man in Dealey Plaza, which does resemble Hemming, I have little else linking him to the plot. Hemming may very well have been involved, but my research into Hemming and the assassination story as I know it have yet to intersect in any meaningful way. I have yet to be able to place Hemming concretely in Dallas at the time. There is no doubt he fit the mold. He was certainly of the same beliefs and attitudes of the men involved in the assassination, but without corroboration or plausible storyline involving him, Hemming may have been just right where he said he was. Hall, on the other hand, was most certainly guilty. He, like many other of the men questioned about the assassination, provided over-the-top explanations going above and beyond what was needed to say in order to defend himself. He had even testified with immunity before the House Subcommittee on Assassinations in the 1970s. Hall tried very hard to establish an alibi for November 22, 1963, claiming he was in Los Angeles. He testified that his wife had seen him on that date, which has never been corroborated. He also claimed he had been at a business called IPCO Hospital Supply from noon until around 3.30 p.m. with a man named Robert Hudson. 
IPCO actually employed Hall beginning a few weeks after the assassination. Hudson had provided a statement to investigators giving Hall a much-needed alibi. However, his statements were later quietly recanted, according to Harold Weisberg. Quote, it was preliminarily... Uh, It was preliminary that Mr. Hudson and Hall were lunching together and discussing the sale of an automobile. The Hudson statement was conclusive to time and date. However, after Hall's appearance in court in Bakersfield, California, Hudson recanted his statement and little note of this was made, or as I was to find out, was not made available at the state level to influence the decision on getting Hall to New Orleans. Hall, as you well know, is a master of the twisted story, events, etc., I think I recall your conversation pretty close when you guys were in Los Angeles talking to Hall at the VA hospital that Hall could be a trigger man. Weisberg continued stating that Hall had been traveling around the country for a year or more, speaking and raising money for various groups, but once November 22, 1963 arrived, all of Hall's activities stopped cold. Was his ceasing of activities due to his culpability in Kennedy's assassination or simply a general sense of impending doom for all attached to the anti-Castro movement? probably a bit of both. According to David Kaiser, in his 2008 book, The Road to Dallas, he, Hall, drove with Hemming to Florida in early 1963, stopping over in Dallas where they had met oil geologist Lester Logue, Robert Morris, and General Walker, and received some funds from Logue, a political associate of H.L. Hunt. The timing of Hall's first trip to Dallas was determined to have been in March of 1963. It was later on in April of 1963 that Hemming and Hall arrived in Miami, where they are said to have met with Santos Traficante, Sam Giancana, and Johnny Roselli. The alleged purpose of this meeting was to discuss an upcoming upcoming raid on Cuba led by adventurer Eddie Bayo, scheduled for June. Even though Hall was known to Traficante, I find the likelihood that this meeting occurred is slim. If it did occur, it was most certainly not in regards to anti-Castro operations. Three of the biggest names in the American Mafia in 1963 gather in Miami to meet with Lauren Hall about Cuba? Really? I don't think so. No. Uh, Now, would these guys have head to Miami to meet with Lauren Hall, potential gunman in the assassination of President Kennedy? That is a far more believable story if this meeting actually took place. Unfortunately, all we have are vague generalities on the timing of Hall and Hemings' trip. What we know is that the two met with General Edwin Walker at his home in Dallas in late March of 1963. This is just prior to the shooting at Walker's home on April 10th, allegedly by Lee Harvey Oswald. It is around this time that the two men arrive in Miami, but we are left guessing the exact dates. Even if we had dates provided to us by authoritative sources, could we really trust them to be correct? What seems much more likely is that Hall and Hemming left Los Angeles for Dallas, where they met with Walker and planned his staged assassination attempt, which would occur on April 10th. A witness identified as Kirk Coleman, who was a 14-year-old neighbor of Walker's, told investigators that there were two men involved in the shooting and that neither of them was Oswald. Coleman heard the shot from the doorway of his bedroom, which led to the yard north side on the north side of his home. Upon running outside, he looked over the fence bordering the Mormon church adjacent to his house where he observed the two men. Although it was dark out, Coleman was aided by the floodlights in the church parking lot, giving him a clear view of the men and their activities. They were on the other side of the church parking lot, about 25 to 30 feet from Coleman's fence. He described one of the men as 5'10", 130 pounds, and really skinny. He had bushy brown hair, a thin face, and a large nose. He believed this man to be young, around 19 to 20 years old. He stated this man rushed back uh, from uh, the back of the car, which had been idling with his lights on. He stated it was a 1950 white or tan Ford. The man entered the vehicle hurriedly and left the scene. The second man was described by Coleman as having been around six foot one, weighing 200 pounds. He had long, dark sleeve shirt on and dark pants. Coleman was unable to provide any further description. Before getting into his vehicle, a 1958 black and white two-tone Chevy, the man leaned into the back seat through the driver's side door as though placing something there. The car had also been left idling with the lights on. The man entered the driver's seat and sped away. Coleman told investigators he had never seen these men at Walker's home before or after the attempt on his life. After being shown numerous pictures of Oswald, he declined to name Oswald as one of the two men. According to James Kelleher's book, He Was Expendable, National Security, uh, Political and Bureaucratic Cover-Ups, a man named Max Claunch was working security detail for Walker several days before the attempt on his life. He had seen a suspicious vehicle drive by Walker's home several times. He described this car as a 1957 Chevy, and the driver was described as a Cuban or dark-complected. Another associate of Walker's identified as Robert Allen Surrey had a similar experience. Surrey was also the man responsible for the controversial Welcome Mr. Kennedy flyer that appeared in Dallas on the day of the assassination. 
Two days before the attempt on Walker, Surrey observed a new model, dark brown or maroon, four-door Ford with two men standing nearby. The men were described as having been in their 30s, around 5'10". Both were wearing nice shirts and suits. They had been looking in the windows at Walker's home. He reported the incident to Walker. However, the men were never located or identified. During the Garrison investigation, a man named Jules Rico Kimball was interviewed due to his alleged connections to Ferry Shaw and mercenaries surrounding the anti-Castro activities in New Orleans. Kimball was also a member of the Ku Klux Klan and every other right-wing organization which the CIA and FBI sought to penetrate. Kimball had told Garrison that he was a fink for the feds. Garrison believed that Kimball was a reliable witness and had stated most of what Kimball had told him had checked out. Like every other witness, Kimball's testimony is imperfect. He had been, however, in a position to get to know many of the major players involved in the assassination. His specific knowledge of these individuals and their relationships with each other make it evident that he was intimately connected to them. This makes him as good of a witness as any to offer insight into the mindset of these men. When Garrison asked him about the Walker shooting and Oswald's potential involvement, this is what was said. What do you think of General Walker? I mean, you say you know General Walker. Do you think it's true he might have been involved? First of all, you know that Oswald was said to have taken the shot at General Walker. I don't believe it. I think Howard took the shot. Oh, you think Howard took a shot? Certainly. He was in Dallas with all those other crumbs. I don't believe Oswald did it. I don't care, you see. I don't want to go around trying to prove anything. I'm just trying to tell you who did what and why. Well, Oswald supposedly had someone with him. There were perhaps two people involved in it. Like Billy Seymour and Howard, who was always hauling his big Mexican carcass around trying to pull some kind of caper. Lawrence Howard was a dark-skinned Mexican-American. He was born to an Irish father and a Mexican mother on January 17, 1935 in Los Angeles. He had served in the military and became heavily involved with the anti-Castro activities after the revolution. Howard was a large man, coming in 5 foot 11 inches tall and weighing over over the years between 200 and 300 pounds. Pictures of him during the early days of the anti-Castro movement in 61 show a much more lean specimen, however. By the time of the assassination, he had gained an excessive amount of weight. This accounts for the different weight descriptions of him as recalled by witnesses between the early 1960s and November 22, 1963. One characteristic of Howard that should stand out the most is that he is often described as having a pockmarked face or having bumps on his face. He had rough skin and moles on both cheeks. This will become extremely relevant as we have had numerous documented sightings of Oswald accompanied by a man described as a husky Latino with a pockmarked face. Another important descriptor mentioned in the Garrison Files is that he has a pronounced scar over his left eye. Kimball believed the shooting at Walker's house was done by Howard and Seymour, and I have no choice but to concur. The main implication here is that Oswald was not involved. Coleman had a good enough view of the two men present to rule out Oswald as a suspect. Even after viewing photographs of Oswald, he refused to identify him as one of the men on scene that night. Add to that the fact that Oswald doesn't drive, and we can say with certainty that he was not one of the men described by Coleman. This was yet another staged event, staged for the world, designed to incriminate Oswald as a violent radical. It didn't matter that the only witness to the aftermath, Kurt Coleman, couldn't place Oswald at the scene. Once they linked the rifle to Oswald and the bullet recovered from Walker's house to the rifle, it was case closed on Oswald's guilt. Coleman had identified a black and white 58 Chevy driven by a man around six foot tall and 200 pounds with no further description. Max Clanch described a very similar 57 Chevy with a Cuban or dark complected driver circling the block. Do you really think these guys know the difference between a 57 and a 58 Chevy? I think it's fairly obvious that both men were describing the same car. The description of a six foot tall 200 pound man who was dark complected, possibly a Cuban, supports the idea that Howard was in fact driving and thus uh, one of the men involved in the Walker shooting. William Seymour was a small-framed man. He stood between 5'6 and 5'8 inches tall and weighed 150 to 165 pounds, depending on who you ask. He had light brown hair and a receding hairline similar to Oswald's. He was born in Tucson, but lived much of his life in Phoenix, Arizona, which will become extremely important later on. He's often said to have sharp features, including his chin. He was also described by Lawrence Howard as closely resembling Lee Harvey Oswald. It must have been his resemblance to the main character in the assassination story that led to his recruitment for the setup of Oswald. Seymour had undoubtedly been one of the two primary Oswald imposters whose actions created the dissident persona we have all become familiar with. Besides being a suspect or accomplice in the staged shooting at Walker's house, there are numerous other incidents in the months leading up to the assassination in which William Seymour was being mistaken for Oswald. One of the more important events in the assassination story alleged to have involved Oswald was the meeting at Sylvia Odio's on September 27, 1963. One thing to note 
is that Oswald allegedly crossed the border into Mexico on September the 26th. September the 26th is also the date that Oswald closed out his P.O. box and left a forwarding address indicating he was actually still in New Orleans. Sylvia Odio was the daughter of two prominent anti-Castro activists who had been jailed in Cuba in 1963. She claimed she had met Lee Harvey Oswald in late September with two Cubans who had shown up at her home. Odio told the FBI the purpose of their visit was to ask if she would write letters to solicit funds from various Dallas businesses to support the Junta Revolucionaria, or JUR for short, J-U-R-E. Uh, JUR was another Cuban revolutionary group, much like the Friends of Democratic Cuba, which was based out of New Orleans. Odio initially stated that she could not remember all of the names, uh, but she believed that one of the Cubans was named Leopoldo, and that the man she was confident was Lee Harvey Oswald was identified as Leon Oswald. She later told the FBI the third man went by the name Angelo. Note the alias Leon Oswald was the name used by Carrie Thornley in New Orleans when he met Perry Russo. A day after their visit, Odio told the FBI that Leopoldo called her and asked her what she thought of Oswald. She told him that she didn't have much of an opinion of him. Leopoldo told her they were not going to work with him as he was loco. The controversy over this incident involves the identity of these men and the timing of their meeting with Odio. Oswald was in Mexico City, according to the official story, which puts the narrative in a precocious position. The FBI can't put Oswald at Sylvia Odio's apartment, but it also can't admit Oswald was being impersonated. The initial suspect, uh, suspicion by Garrison was that this trio was none other than Howard Hall and Seymour. We know that Howard Hall and Seymour were in Dallas by Lawrence, Hall, uh, by Lawrence Howard's own admission. On or about September 17th, 1963, Howard, uh, Lauren Hall, and Celios Albus, that's just an alias, by the way, departed Los Angeles dri driving Hall's 1956 Oldsmobile and pulling a luggage carrier. Hall planned to stop in Dallas to pick up additional supplies, funds, and contact an unknown man regarding a boat. They arrived in Dallas on about September 20th, 1963. Howard said they remained in Dallas for about 10 days, during which Hall was busy making contacts to obtain additional supplies. How can we say with certainty that our trio of suspects were actually the men who had met with Odio? Because Lauren Hall told us so. On September 16th, 1964, Lauren Hall had met with FBI, and when asked, he confirmed that he, Howard, and Seymour did in fact visit Odio's apartment. An FBI memo on the incident dated September 26th, 1964, titled Lee Harvey Oswald, Internal Security R. Cuba, reads as follows, quote, The following investigation is predicated on information received on September 16th, 1964, from Lauren Hall of Kernville, California that he had met with a woman named Mrs. Odio in Dallas, Texas, in September of 1963. He said he was accompanied at the time by Lawrence Howard, a Mexican-American from Los Angeles, California, and William Seymour from Arizona. A September 25, 1964 report from S.A. Harry H. Whidbey provides more detail elicited from Hall. Quote, Lauren Eugene Hall advised 91664 that in September 1963, he was at Dallas, Texas in company of Lawrence Howard and William Seymour to solicit aid in an anti-Castro movement. Hall contacted many Cubans in the Dallas area. Hall recalled meeting a Cuban woman, Mrs. Odio, who lived in apartment A located on Magellan Circle and the same apartment building where a Cuban friend named Kiki Ferrer uh, was then residing. Hall denies that Lee Harvey Oswald was with him during his visit to Mrs. Odio's apartment. Hall, however, recanted this statement. On September 20th, 1964, he was re-interviewed by the FBI. He now claimed that he was actually in Dallas with Howard and Seymour on two separate occasions, but not with both together. Hall stated that he'd be in error in previously stating that the incident referred to by Sylvia Odio had probably involved a contact by himself, William Seymour, and Lawrence Howard. After reflection regarding trips made by him to Dallas and Miami, he now recalls that he was accompanied by William Seymour and by a Lawrence Howard in Dallas on separate trips to that city. The report goes on to state, quote, Hall said that having eliminated the confusion of his associates of, this, of September and October visits of his recollection, he now does remember... It does not remember any incident where he and the company of two other individuals made contact as such uh, described by Odio. Sorry, but the cat is already out of the bag. Any subsequent attempts to roll back his statements were nothing more than cover up for the obvious mistake of admitting it in the first place. At the time of the interview, Hall obviously didn't understand implications of his confession. Odio was interviewed on October 1st, 1964, and shown a number of pictures of Hall, Howard, and Seymour. She told the FBI that she could not positively identify any of them as the man who visited her. William Seymour and Lawrence Howard denied their involvement in the incident right from the start. 
Seymour claimed he was working in Miami at the time. He claimed that he didn't uh, make a trip to Dallas until mid-October. Despite the fact that Ken Schusler, Seymour's boss at Beach Welding Supplies in Miami, covered for him, Seymour was most certainly in Dallas. According to Schusler, Seymour worked for him daily until he departed the following month, allegedly for Arizona, uh, where his mother lived in mid-October. The thing you have to remember is that these guys work as contract agents for the CIA. Any and all jobs that they may have on their official documentation were nothing more than front jobs, meaning meant to funnel money and provide alibis. Beach welding was no exception. Despite the lies and obfuscation surrounding this incident, it is blatantly obvious that the men who met with Odio were in fact Hull, Howard, and Seymour. The Odio incident is simply one of many where Oswald was identified as having been present when the subject in question was most certainly William Seymour. The significance of this incident is that it demonstrates a pattern of people misidentifying Seymour as Oswald. Another such incident involving this trio occurred at the Carousel Club. Many believe that Oswald was in fact an associate of Jack Ruby, but I have yet to uncover any evidence to support that theory. When I dug into each of the alleged Oswald sightings involving Jack Ruby, again, none of them held up. What I found... Uh, was that at least in as far as the Carousel Club incident on November 10th, 1963, is that the band misidentified as Oswald was most certainly William Seymour. A man by the name of Harvey Lewill Wade of Chattanooga, Tennessee, had gone to Dallas between November 10th and 14th on business. On the evening of November 10th, he had visited the Carousel Club. While at the Carousel Club, he observed who he believed to have been Lee Harvey Oswald in the company of two other men. A report on the incident by FBI S.A. George C. Wellborn states the following. Quote, the person believed Oswald was accompanied by two unknown men. The number one man is described as a white male, early 20s, 5 foot 8 inches tall, 140 pounds, long black hair, very pale complexion and slender build. He had no unusual characteristics and he wore a dark colored suit. He resembled Oswald in appearance. The number two man is described as a white male, 30 to 32 years old, 200 pounds, 5 foot 10 inches tall, stocky build, long black hair, dark complexion, oval face, Mexican or Spanish appearance he had numerous bumps on his face and was believed to have a one-inch scar in the eyebrow of his left eye. The customer on stage with the stripper was described as 5 foot 10 inches tall, 35 years old, 180 pounds, flat top, dark hair, dressed not recalled, and was at the table with one girl and three or four men. Now, this description by Wade is a near exact match to Howard Hall and Seymour, with one exception being the description of Oswald's hair as being long and black. In 1963, long was a subjective term. Many back then believed hair longer than an inch was considered long. As far as the man's hair being described as black, Wade was in a dimly lit nightclub. And so it was likely the man's hair appeared darker than it actually was. The description uh, that really gives it away is the one referring to Lawrence Howard, a stocky man, Mexican in appearance, with numerous bumps on his face and a scar over his left eyebrow. That is unquestionably Lawrence Howard. If that man was Lawrence Howard and the circumstances and common sense will tell us that the other two men were Lauren Hall and the man who could pass for Oswald, William Seymour. This report goes on to state that these three men participated in a, quote, memory skit with Bill Damaris, who was actually Bill Damar, and that's actually an alias, uh, the entertainer on stage who was known to have performed acts of hypnosis for the crowd. Does the person we have come to know as Lee Harvey Oswald have the type of personality that would engage in a memory skit? No, not at all. Oswald was a loner, and he's never reported to have any unknown associates in Dallas, especially ones that resemble Hall and Howard. I think it's plainly obvious. The men observed by Wade at the Carousel Club were, in fact, our trio of mercenaries, Hall, Howard, and Seymour. Wade was shown several photographs, including one of Larry Crawford, the man who claimed to be Oswald at the Texas Employment Commission. It is unknown which men uh, were in the photographs shown to Wade, but he had refused to identify any of them as the men he saw at the Carousel Club. We already know that the man resembling Oswald was not Oswald. The real Oswald was allegedly at the Payne residence in Fort Worth that evening, although we can't trust the testimony of anyone living at the Payne residence. So was Oswald really in Fort Worth that night? Honestly, it doesn't even matter where he was because in as far as this incident goes, the preponderance of evidence tells us it was William Seymour. Wade was later interviewed by Garrison investigator Bill Boxley on October 25th, 1967. Wade confirmed that his previous statements and his testimony as described in the Warren Commission were accurate. Wade had obviously become familiar with the story surrounding Oswald and made the statement to Boxley, of course Oswald was not there. Boxley's report continues. Wade responded exuberantly, however, when informed that Oswald undoubtedly had a double in Dallas as well as other places with him and seemed relieved that he had not made the mistaken identification of Oswald, which the FBI questioner had indicated he must have. 
<clears throat> Boxley displayed a photograph of Lawrence Howard to Wade. Wade was unable to make the identification and stated Howard appeared to have too stern an expression on his face. The problem with this identification is that when you come to identify the cast of characters, the inner circle of the assassination, there simply isn't another husky-looking Mexican with numerous bumps on his face and a scar over his left eye anywhere to be found. No other known person in any of the assassination literature comes close to matching this description. The specifics of this description could only indicate one man, Lawrence Howard. Garrison knew this as well. He had been looking for a husky pockmarked Latin since 1961, when a man matching the description accompanied another Oswald lookalike to the Bolton Ford dealership in New Orleans. On January 20th, 1961, a time when Oswald is known to have been in the Soviet Union, Oscar W. Deslat, a sales manager at Bolton Ford in New Orleans, was approached by two men who were interested in purchasing several, several vehicles on behalf of the Friends of Democratic Cuba. According to the FBI, DeSlat could not provide a specific description of either man. Uh, however, that is not what he told. He and his boss, Fred Sewell, told Garrison's investigators. One of the men was described as being heavy, pockmarked Latin, who was olive complexioned with an athletic build and a scar over his left eye. In 1961, Lawrence Howard was training with Jerry Hemming down in the Florida Keys. Pictures of him at the time show a much more lean Howard before he put on excessive weight. The other man with him was described as resembling Lee Harvey Oswald and had actually identified himself to Lee, uh, as Lee Oswald to Dislat. The names Oswald and Joseph Moore were written on the truck purchase price estimate sheet that provided to them. The estimate document uh, substantiating Dislat's and Sewell's account of the incident is present in both the FBI and Garrison files. When DeSlat was shown a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald, he said that he had never seen the man displayed to him and that he could not say that he was the man who accompanied the Latin man he believed to be Joseph Moore on that date. DeSlat remembered the incident because of the name of the organization the men provided, Friends of Democratic Cuba, which he thought was rather unusual. The one thing about DeSlat that stands out as rather questionable is that when he was subpoenaed by Garrison to speak before a grand jury in the case of Clay Shaw, his lawyer of choice was G. Ray Gill, the notorious mob attorney, whose main client was none other than Carlos Marcello. Another interesting coincidence is that DeSlat had told a friend of his about the incident in 1961, identified as Charles Pearson, manager of the Graham Paper Company. Pearson then relayed the story to Mary Cusco, a clerk who worked for him at Graham. Cusco then told another well-known character in the assassination story, Carlos Brunier. Brunier, of course, being the anti-Castro Cuban who had been involved in the scuffle with Oswald in front of the International Trade Mart on August 9th, 1963. Brunier reported this incident to A.C. John Rice of the Secret Service on December 9th, 1963. Once again, we have characters resurfacing and involving themselves in even secondary aspects of the assassination story. When all factors are taken into consideration, this incident has the feeling of being another staged event. Uh, the Friends of Democratic Cuba had been formed by a man named William Dalzell along with Guy Bannister and was run out of Guy Bannister's office at 544 Camp Street. They had no known operating budget. The organization only existed on paper for just over a month and had no documented activities. Providing their name for the purchase of several trucks does only one thing. It lights a path that leads to 544 Camp Street and all the shady activities conducted there. According to researcher William Davey, the Friends of Democratic Cuba was strictly a dummy front. In fact, an informant for New Orleans DA Jim Garrison revealed that the group was an undercover operation in conjunction with the CIA and FBI, which involved the shipment and transportation of individuals and supplies in and out of Cuba. As a side note, the same informant revealed at Garrison's office that the FBI liaison was none other than Regis Kennedy, Hoover's point man with the anti-Castro community in New Orleans. Why this incident occurred is anyone's guess. Why the name of Oswald was used when Oswald was provably out of the country is still a mystery. I chalk this off to extremely poor planning in as far as an attempt to paint Oswald as a dissident. If Oswald was allegedly a communist, why would he be palling around with the most rabid anti-communists in the country? Who were the men that visited Deslat that day? The debate over this still rages. The description of this Latin man includes him having a pockmarked face and a scar over his left eye. Could this once again be Lawrence Howard? We know very little about the specific whereabouts of Howard and his activities during this time period in 61. We know that he was working with Jerry Hemming in the Florida Keys in 61. This does not preclude him, however, from traveling to New Orleans during this time. The same goes for William Seymour. Seymour trained the anti-Castro Cubans at No Name Key in 1961, but we also know that at some point he had lived at or at least stayed in New Orleans. Seymour is said to have been the New Orleans representative for the Double Check Corporation, a CIA front based out of Miami. 
Another known character in the assassination story, Gordon Novell, is also associated with Double Check. That would infer an association between Novell and Seymour, and we know Novell was a direct associate of David Ferry. No references allude to the time when Seymour was associated with the New Orleans branch of this company. The lack of supporting information on the whereabouts of Howard and Seymour in early 61 make placing them at Bolton Ford a challenge. However, if I were a betting man, I know where I'd place my money. David Ferry is also known to have associated with a Latin man of similar description to Lawrence Howard. A memo in Garrison's lead files from 1967 states the following, quote, Attorney Ray Gill recalls seeing a heavyset Cuban come up to visit Ferry from time to time. Gill describes him as very rough looking and had pockmarked. This is essentially the same description which we've had encountered from other persons, including Harvey Wade. We should really be moving ahead faster on getting a precise identification on this heavyset Latin character who has shown up all over the place from early 61 all the way through 63 at the Carousel Club in Dallas. So Garrison believed that this pockmarked individual was in fact the same man that was seen everywhere from New Orleans to Dallas over a span of two years. As there are no smoking guns in the investigation, we have to make do with what we have. To me, the preponderance of evidence lays the identification of this man right at the feet of Lawrence Howard. However, as everyone involved in the assassination appears to have some kind of, uh, some kind of body double, there is always a chance that the sightings of the heavyset pockmark Latin are actually of more than one man. Harvey Wade described the man as having been in his 30s, whereas the Slat and Sewell described the man as being in his 40s. Wade said the heavyset, dark complected man at the Carousel Club was 5'10", whereas the Slat and Sewell stated the man was 5'8". Is this over-scrutinizing a minor difference in description, or does it actually provide a significant clue indicating that there were, in fact, two different men? Witness statements that include these descriptions have to be looked at in a broader context and viewed along with the totality of circumstances in order to make any determination as to their accuracy. The circumstances, timing, and behavior of the three men at the Carousel Club make it clear to me that the men seen by Wade were Hall, Howard, and Seymour. If the man Bolton Ford was not Howard, it means that in almost 60 years of Kennedy research, there is another man closely associated to David Ferry and Guy Bannister that matches Lawrence Howard's basic description, yet has never been named or identified. I find the likelihood of this to be minimal at best, but there's always that possibility. Another incident involving uh, Oswald and a dark-complected Latin occurred at the Havana Bar in New Orleans in September of 1963. The HSCA report 180-10128-1002, um, the McKinney briefing materials, uh, bartender Evaristo Rodriguez was deposed on July 21st, 1964 for the Warren Commission. He described a patron of the bar as a man who resembled Oswald, who was accompanied by a stocky-built Latin man who spoke Spanish. He described this man as having resembled a Mexican or that he was from another Latin country. The man was described in his late 20s or early, and, and was overly hairy. He said this man ordered tequila while o Oswald ordered a lemonade. He told the Warren Commission attorney, Wesley J. Liebler, uh, that since he didn't have uh, lemonade, he asked to ask his boss, Orest Pena, how to make one. It was at this time that Pena also described the man that Rodriguez was convinced was Oswald. Rodriguez went on to state that he later saw the man he believed was Oswald appearing quite drunk with his arm around the Latin, quote, getting sick. Rodriguez also described Oswald as wearing a clip-on bow tie that was hanging off his collar. Does this sound like the loner dissident Lee Harvey Oswald we all know? Definitely not. The timing of this incident in September 1963 corresponds with the travels of Howard and Seymour as they made their way back and forth between Los Angeles, Dallas, and New Orleans, and Miami. Again, we have an incident involving a husky Latin man, possibly a Mexican, seen with a man described as Oswald, or at minimum resembling Oswald. This pair has been seen all over the place together, and still the only members of the cast of characters that match these descriptions, despite the variations in witness testimony, are Lawrence Howard and William Seymour. Long before the incident at the Havana Bar, a man named Jerry Buchanan alleged that in October of 1962, there had been a scuffle involving members of the Fair Play for Cuba committee in Miami. One of the members of Fair Play for Cuba committee who had allegedly been observed during the scuffle was Lee Harvey Oswald. Jerry Buchanan's brother, Jim uh, Buchanan, was a writer for the Pompano Beach, Florida Sun Sentinel newspaper. At the time of the alleged incident involving FPCC, Jerry Buchanan was a member of the International Anti-Communist Brigade in Miami under the direction of a man named Frank Fiorini, a.k.a. Frank Sturgis. Sturgis, one of the Watergate burglars, had a long history of service to organizations like the CIA, Army Intelligence, and even the Mossad. You have to take everything the guy says to investigators with more than a grain of salt. Sturgis is a liar through and through. However, even liars can provide good information from time to time, usually inadvertently.
Sturgis told investigators that Jerry Buchanan was the head of propaganda for the International Anti-Communist Brigade and that they had a falling out over the kinds of propaganda they had been publishing. He was implying that this tale of Oswald in Miami was nothing more than that. Propaganda. Quote, it was pointed out to Mr. Fiorini that according to Jerry Buchanan, Lee Harvey Oswald was one of the FPCC who engaged in a fight in Bayfront Park and further that Oswald was again in Miami as of March of 63 distributing pro-Castro literature. According to O'Connor's report, quote, Mr. Buchanan said that it was his understanding Oswald had engaged in distributing liter literature in Miami across the street from Freedom Tower, where the Cuban Refugee Center is located in Miami. It was pointed out to Mr. Buchanan that he had said that uh, he had told Mr. John Martino of Miami Beach, Florida, that his brother, Jerry Buchanan, had engaged in a fight with Lee Harvey Oswald at Miami and that Martino could use that information in lecture engagements in as much as it was true. Mr. Buchanan was advised that, according to Mr. Martino, the fight between Jerry Buchanan and Oswald occurred when Oswald attempted to board a boat being used by Jerry Buchanan and Cuban exiles in an anti-Castro operation. It was also pointed out to Mr. Buchanan that Nathaniel Whale of Delray Beach, Florida, had advised he, that Buchanan, had informed him that Jerry Buchanan had a fight with Oswald in Miami about January of 63 when Oswald was distributing pro-Castro literature. So what we have is a series of events in Miami, whereas it is alleged that Oswald had been involved with Fair Play for Cuba activities between October of 1962 and March of 1963. This is long before the official story places Oswald among their ranks in May of 1963. The FBI chalked this off as fabrication, but I can't help think there may be more to it than that. I believe we can say with confidence that uh, if these events did occur, Lee Harvey Oswald was not the man involved. If they did occur, the times of the alleged incidents would align with the times that William Seymour was known to have been residing in the Miami area. Was there an active operation happening meant to establish Lee Harvey Oswald as a communist in Miami at the same time he was living in Dallas? Or were these just the ramblings of an alleged anti-communist propagandist as Fiorini told the FBI? Either way, it demonstrates that the name Lee Harvey Oswald was being circulated in the area by men who one way or another were connected to the anti-Castro movement and the events of November 22nd. When I began to realize that so many of the alleged sightings of Oswald were not actually Oswald and that William Seymour was responsible for a large number of these sightings, I had to go back and reevaluate the commonly known Oswald incidents that we all take for granted. One of the more well-known incidents that neither lone assassin or conspiracy nuts have disputed involves Oswald's actions at the Sportsdrom rifle range in Dallas. The official story says that Oswald went to the rifle range where he drew attention to himself when he shot at another person's target. The other person was range patron and assassination witness Garland Slack. Slack happened to be a witness to Oswald shooting at the rifle range and a witness to the assassination itself as he was standing on Houston Street when John Kennedy was killed. The incident involving Garland Slack and, uh, and Oswald shooting at the wrong target is only a portion of this incident that has remained in the public consciousness. The real story of the sports drone is far more nuanced. The vast majority of information we can gather from this incident, or rather incidents, as you shall soon see, does more to disprove the notion that Oswald ever visited the rifle range than confirm it. In researching the witness testimony related to the sports drone, I realized that many of the alleged Oswald sightings at the range were on different dates and at different times. This meant that there was no single incident with numerous witnesses. There were numerous incidents. Going through the statements of those witnesses forced me to remember how fallible witness testimony actually is. Oswald was described as everything from 5'6 to 5'11 with blonde hair, black hair, and everything in between. Despite the variations in descriptions provided to law enforcement, the one thing every witness could agree on is that it was Lee Harvey Oswald they saw at the sports drum. Malcolm Price was a friend of Virginia and Floyd Davis, the owners of the sports drum, and had been a kind of hangaround who often helped the Davises out with customers. Price was not officially an employee, but had nonetheless worked at the range since it had opened in September of 1963. According to Price's testimony to the Warren Commission, Oswald first made an appearance at the range on Saturday, September 28, 1963. This is two days after Oswald had allegedly crossed the border into Mexico and a day after the incident at Sylvia Odio's apartment. Quote, Mr. Liebler, uh, commission has information to the effect that sometime during November 63, you saw a gentleman at the rifle range whom you subsequently came to believe was Lee Harvey Oswald. Is that correct? That's right. The first time I saw this person was in September, the last week of the last day of September, and that was uh, the afternoon they had opened the range on the last Saturday of September. 
Yes. That would be September 28th. Yes. So it would appear that Mr. Liebler was attempting to steer the witness into a November time frame for the Oswald sighting. The later sightings of him were in fact in November. However, Price putting Oswald at the range on September 28th does not jive with official story claims that Oswald was in Mexico City. Price tells Liebler that Oswald came to the range at about dusk on the 28th, just before it closed. He came alone driving a 1940 or 41 Ford. He comments that he had since heard that Oswald doesn't drive, but assured the commission that Oswald had certainly driven himself there that night. He tells Liebler that Oswald asked him if he could sight his rifle, as he had just had a scope mounted on it. Oswald set up a target at 100 yards, and Price fired the rifle a dozen or more times while setting the scope. He then handed the rifle back to Oswald, who only fired three shots before collecting the casings and calling it a day. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Liebler proceeds to ask Price about the rifle and when, and whether or not he had seen the rifle on more than one occasion. Price tells him that he did see it again as Oswald had returned to the range two more times while he was present. The dates he gave were October 12th and 13th. However, information provided by Garland Slack indicates that one or both of these dates may actually have been in November. Slack observed Oswald on the range November 9th, 10th, and 17th. Both Slack and Price recall seeing Oswald on the day of the, quote, turkey shoot, which was in November. This indicates that one of the October dates provided by Price is wrong. Price goes on to explain that he and Oswald talked about the scope of the rifle. Oswald had told him that it was the clearest scope he'd ever seen and that he'd only paid $18 for it. He then clarified that Oswald indicated the $18 was just for the scope, not for the rifle. Oswald told him that he had the scope mounted on uh, by a gunsmith in Cedar Hill and that it was mounted on a Redfield mount. When asked about the specifics of the rifle, the conversation went like this. Mr. Liebler, did you see the rifle closely that day? You must have handled it in looking through the scope. Oh, yes, I handled it. It was a Mauser type rifle. What do you mean by that? I don't know anything about rifles. Well, it's strictly a military rifle and it's patterned after the German Mauser. A bolt action? A bolt action, and the general outline it had about it, possibly a six-shot clip uh, set just ahead of the trigger, and I understand it was a 6.5 Italian, but at that time, I didn't know. I thought it was a Mauser because there's a friend of mine in Grand Prairie that has an Argentine Mauser that was a 7.6, and it looked very familiar. They looked a whole lot alike. So in describing the gun, Price tells Liebler that he believes it was a Mauser-style rifle, similar to the one owned by a friend. The conversation continues. I saw the serial number, and the gun wasn't blued at the time. It had a bright finish on the barrel. It looked like it had been placed in a lathe and turned down, as far as, well, in an attempt to sporterize the gun. It had been worked on in some manner in an attempt to sporterize it? I thought it had. How far did the barrel protrude from the stock? Like, how far did it stick past the end of the stock? Possibly six or eight inches at most. Had the stock been cut back in this attempt to sporterize the rifle? Well, not that I could tell. It was similar to German Mauser, and they have, you know, they've got the full-length, almost full-length stock with a wooden piece on the top of them. And the wooden piece on top was still on this rifle, which you did see. No, I don't believe it was. It had been taken off? Yes. It had been taken off as part of the attempt to sporterize the rifle? Yes. So here it is very clear. The rifle observed and handled by Price was not Oswald's Carcano 6.5 millimeter. The difference described by Price indicates that the upper portion of the wooden stock which covers the top of the barrel had been removed and the barrel itself had been worked on in a lathe. The barrel was also described by Price as having been 6 to 8 inches from the tip to the beginning of the stock as compared to 3 inches on a, mar on a Carcano. The weapon that Price is describing is an Argentine Mauser model 1891 sporterized edition. There is little similarity to the Carcano other than the bolt action mechanism. Liebler presses Price to identify the photos of the Carcano presented to him as the same weapon he handled when Oswald was at the range. Despite his efforts, Price does not capitulate, but rather says the rifle and the photos look similar to the rifle he saw except for the sling mounts and that the stock and barrel configuration was different. Liebler is obviously trying to force a square peg into a round hole. Liebler asks about the scope on the rifle and whether or not Price can identify the scope in the photos as the same one he saw in person. The scope on Oswald's Carcano was branded with Ordnance Optics, Inc., Hollywood, California, 010, Japan. Price, however, insisted that the scope the rifle had was a Tuskoska brand, also manufactured in Japan. Quote, I might not be right about the brand name, but I believe it was a Tuskasa. Uh, since I examined it, it was a Japanese scope, but 
Uh, they made several brands of those things. It could be any one of them, but I believe, as I remember it, it was a Tuscasca. Liebler eventually shows Price a series of photographs, presumably of Lee Harvey Oswald. One of the photos must have been of Oswald's booking photo as Price commented on the mark on Oswald's forehead. When asked point blank if the man in the series of photographs was the man he had dealt with the shooting range, Price's answer didn't do much to settle the question as we would hope. I will hand you some pictures. This is a quote. I will hand you some pictures and see if you can recognize any of the people in them as the man you saw at the rifle range. These have been previously marked commission exhibits number 451 and 453 through 456. Yes, this is the only one that has any similarity I can recall. You're referring, you're referring to number 45. Does that look like him? Well, these all seem like a photograph of the same man, but this is the only one that has any resemblance as I can remember. So out of the four or five photographs shown to Price, only one of them actually resembled the man he spoke with at the rifle range. Not exactly the solid endorsement I would have liked to have put an end to any debate. Price's testimony, when looked at in a broad perspective, tells us that the man he met with was not Oswald and that the rifle and scope the man brought to the range was not the 65 millimeter Carcano. The man drove himself to the range in a 1940s Ford, and I think it's been made absolutely clear thus far that Oswald didn't drive. The rifle and that Liebler tried so hard to link to the sports drone incidents, the Carcano was actually an Argentine Mauser. None of Price's testimony puts Oswald at the range, nor does it place the Carcano in Oswald's hands. His testimony only reinforced the man, only reinforced the idea that there was a man in Dallas who was often mistaken for Oswald. The next witness to provide meaningful information about Oswald's appearance at the sports drone was Garland Slack. Slack had been a longtime friend of the owner, Floyd Davis, and was a regular customer at the range. He distinctly recalled that Oswald had been at the range on November 9th, 10th, and 17th of 1963. The 10th was also the night that Harvey Wade observed Oswald at the Carousel Club. It was the 17th that he recalled the incident of Oswald firing at his target. Slack was in the adjacent lane and saw that before he even had a chance to shoot, his target had already been hit. He then saw Oswald firing in a rapid pattern. Three or four shots, then take aim then three or four more shots. According to Slack, there were about seven or eight boys firing on the range that day, and he made a broad announcement to all of them to keep their rifles pointed at their own targets. He never confronted Oswald directly about it. Slack goes on to make some interesting statements about the scope of Oswald's rifle. We've already covered the testimony of Malcolm Price, who stated that he set the scope on Oswald's rifle on the first date the range was open, September 28th. Slack, however, testified in deposition that he had known the boy who had set the scope, and that it was done on Wednesday between the 10th and 17th of November. He couldn't remember the boy's name, but he surely wasn't referring to Malcolm Price, the 40-something semi-retired man. What is to be made of this discrepancy? Could the person mistaken for Oswald have had two rifles uh, scoped for him at the sports drone? Liebler asks Slack about the rifle's appearance. Did you have a chance to see the rifle at hand? Uh, I absolutely saw the rifle. What kind of rifle was it? It was an Italian-type rifle, but it never showed up in the newspapers, a picture of that rifle. In other words, if the first picture that came out of the officer holding the rifle that was on the floor of the book depository, if that was the gun, I had never seen that gun before, and I know rifles, and I know scopes. So now we're here, we have, now we're zero for two in an identification of the rifle by range witnesses. Slack tells Liebler he wouldn't shoot a toad frog with one of them because he knew they were just junk. Slack then indicates that Oswald was not there alone. He tells Liebler that when Oswald arrived, someone had handed Oswald his rifle over the fence, that he did not walk it through the main entrance. He tells Liebler about another boy he believed was with Oswald that was well over six foot tall, very heavy set, had enormous feet. He said this man had a full beard. This is where the dissecting of events at the sports drone becomes fuzzy. The six foot tall man who Slack believed was, Os was with Oswald on that occasion is a matter of much confusion. The man was identified as Michael Bentley Murph, a resident of Dallas. I located Murph's 1955 high school yearbook and photo at archive.org, so Murph was definitely real. Uh, it was not an alias. The FBI located him after his license plate was traced to a red and white Chevy Impala registered to him. He told the FBI he had gone to the range alone and then he didn't really speak to anyone else while he was there. He also did not know or see Lee Harvey Oswald while he was there. His story is plausible and his name appears nowhere else in the assassination record. I tend to believe him. This is where the identification of the tall, heavy set man believed by Slack um, gets interesting. Murph truly looks as though he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He fired from lane 8 while Oswald was on lane 7 on November 17th. 
Slack may have seen this and believed they were together. Murph was traced by the license plate on his red and white Impala, which he had left the range in that day. Even though Slack believed these men were together, he later described uh, um, later described that Oswald had left with a big man in an older model colored an older dark colored sedan. The person Oswald allegedly left with could not have been Murph because Murph left in a red and white Impala. The implication here is that Oswald was there with another person. It was just not the person Slack believed him to be. Slack has asked about Oswald's description and like Malcolm Price, he has shown several photographs. This is what was said. Is this the guy you saw? Does anyone in those pictures look like him? Those heavy eyebrows and that part in the hair, but apparently he had more hair and maybe he got a haircut afterwards. Who had more hair? The fellow, the picture, the man I saw in this picture right here, the man you saw had more hair. Yes, he sure did. Do you think any of these pictures are of the man you saw at the rifle that day? The difference in position he was in and everything that looked like him, but he wasn't that sleepy eyed. He was a cocky guy. Slack eventually identifies one of the photos to him shown marked as Piso 453-C. He then talks about how this one photo is exactly how he looked in person when he saw him on television just before he was shot, but that none of the other photographs resemble this man. Slack also said that Oswald and his large companion had brought three rifles with them that day. Lucille remembers the boy handing the guns over the fence and they were throwing the guns in the back of the old model car and taking off like they did. And I recognize that because a gun, a good gun, you're not supposed to, they just threw these old guns in that car. Or they took two of them, of course. One was wrapped in a blanket, a dirty-looking old gray blanket that had a red trim. I remember the sporterized Italian gun was tied up, and he handed it over the fence nicely. And he had a gray and red, uh, gray and red maroon looked slick as satin. And I remember it as well. What a gun case! You see everything at a shooting place. Some bring a rifle and a tote sack, and for a gun case. Slack also tells investigators that the man who drove Oswald to the rifle range was named Fraser. How? Uh, he came to know this is never clarified in the documents. I do not believe that this uh, coming to know this name was by chance either. I do not believe that Buell Frazier, Oswald's associate of the book depository, ever drove anyone to the rifle range. I do believe that his name was dropped as part of a scheme to set Frazier up as a second patsy as needed, if needed. I will cover this in much more detail later on. I only make mention of it to uh, to be clear, that I do not believe for a second that Frazier was the man who uh, was with Oswald at the rifle range. As it stands, I have only one suspect who could have been mistaken for Oswald and was accompanied by a large husky man with a long hair and beard, William Seymour. In my quest to find any corroboration for Seymour having posed as Oswald at the sports drone, I come across a February 28, 1974 article by a man named Richard Raznikoff. The article, titled From Dallas to Watergate, covers the main players in the Watergate affair and highlights the fact that many of the names involved in Watergate seem to cross paths with many of the names in Kennedy assassination when it came to the anti-Castro-Cuban movement in Miami, particularly involving the men working out of No Name Key. The article mentions William Seymour as one of these men. Also at No Name Key was William Seymour, who was later to impersonate Oswald in Dallas at a rifle range called the Sports Drome a gun shop and a, and a new car agency. At each of these places, he was to give his name as Lee Harvey Oswald, although in each instance, it was manifestly impossible that he could have been Oswald. What are we to make of this? Who knows? The article does nothing in as far as corroborating this information. We can really hold it to no factual account. The statement holds no evidentiary value, but that does not it hold, mean it holds no value. Reading this statement from Raznikov in his 1974 article reassured me in as far as I was not alone, nor was I crazy, for believing that it was Seymour making the rounds as Oswald in all of the same places. Raznikov mentions that Seymour was to give the name Lee Oswald at a gun shop. This brings us to the story of Dial Ryder and the Irving Sports Shop. Oswald allegedly had work done on the rifle at a gun shop. How complicated could this part of the story get? Little did I know that this one small incident would turn out to be just as insane as everything else I had come across thus far. In short, Dial Rider, an employee of the Irving Sports Shop, finds a work ticket for drilling, tapping, and bore sighting with the name Oswald on it. The ticket seemed to appear out of nowhere, found lodged between his desk and the wall the Saturday evening following the assassination. He testified before the Warren Commission that he could not identify Lee Harvey Oswald as having been a customer in the store. He also stated to attorney Wesley Liebler that even though he recognized the handwriting on the ticket as his own, he had no recollection of having drawn up that ticket. 
He was shown a picture of the rifle that was located in the book depository and asked if he had worked on said rifle and whether or not he had attached a scope to it. Ryder explained that he personally had never worked on an Italian model such as the one in the photos and that he cannot connect the tag to Oswald's rifle. He confidently told Liebler that he did not believe anyone at the Irving Sports Shop had worked on the rifle he was being shown photos of because of how the scope was mounted to the rifle. He stated that when they drill holes in the rifle to attach the scope mount, they typically use the same mounts which require three holes be drilled. When he saw photos of the Carcano rifle in custody, he stated his shop never used the cheap mount that was attached to, rifle, to Oswald's rifle. He said that Oswald's rifle also had a mount attached to only utilized two bolts and that the mount using two holes would not have been done at Irving's sports shop. To further confirm this, Ryder tells Liebler that he had been in contact with a female reporter from the Washington Press, although he could not recall, recall her name. After their initial conversation, this reporter contacted Klein Sporting Goods, the store the Carcano was allegedly purchased from. According to Ryder, this report informed him that the rifle shipped from Klein's was pre-drilled and came with the mount, meaning it just needed to be screwed in. That means that there was no need to bring the rifle in for drilling. Being that Ryder could not recall ever seeing Oswald in the store, and he had never seen the, or worked on the Italian rifle in question, one has to wonder why the work tag appeared in the first place. The incident at the Irving Sports Shop is ultimately a dead end. Did Seymour drop off the rifles prior to the Sports Drome Rifle Range uh, for a service in Irving? It's possible, but in the end, it's irrelevant. What we know is that the rifle appearing in the photo shown to Ryder, allegedly the Carcano, was not worked on by anyone at the sports shop, and the tag with the name Oswald could not be connected to any person or any known rifle. Ryder had told investigators that the store had called all of the Oswalds in the phone book, but were unable to connect any of them to the work order. The overall circumstances of the incident tells me that this was going to be part of the false trail connecting Oswald to the rifle. However, it seems to have failed in its purpose as this story gets little attention and is not often referenced in the official story narratives. The third incident mentioned in Richard Raznikov's article uh, was, that was attributed to William Seymour involved Oswald's appearance at a car dealership in Dallas. Eugene M. Wilson, employee of the downtown Lincoln Mercury auto dealership, insisted to investigators that Lee Harvey Oswald had test-driven a red Comet Caliente on November, 20, uh, November 2nd, 1963. The Warren Commission completely disregarded Wilson's account of this incident based on the known facts that incident uh, that indicate Oswald didn't drive. Of course, the Warren Commission had to disavow this incident because it would contradict the official story narrative. They also couldn't admit that Oswald was being impersonated, just like the Sylvia Odio incident. So instead of acknowledging that these events actually happened, it was easier for them to, to claim witnesses involved must have been mistaken. I wonder if there are any other cases in, world, in the world that have hundreds of mistaken witnesses or if this is just unique to the Kennedy assassination. Salesman Albert Bogart is the man who accompanied Oswald on his high-speed test drive on the streets of Dallas. Bogard claims that Oswald definitely knew how to drive and that he reached speeds of up to 85 miles per hour on the highway. Bogard stated that Oswald couldn't afford vehicles $300 down payment and instead told him that he would return in two to three weeks with the full cash car for the value which was $3,500. Could the man that Bogard and Wilson dealt with on November 2nd have been William Seymour? Absolutely. It, it was definitely not Oswald as I am a stark believer that Oswald we know did not drive. What purpose could this incident have served? I think it's pretty obvious that the incident was meant to establish witnesses to the fact that Oswald was supposed to have received some large payout around the time of the assassination. This incident seems to have served its purpose, with the exception being that Oswald was not a vehicular operator. This is what I believe was just sloppy work on behalf of the conspirators while laying this false trail from Oswald to the assassination. Before we move on, there is one last incident connecting Hall, Howard, and Seymour to the assassination that must be addressed. This involves the delivery of a package from New Orleans to Lawrence Howard at the Executive Inn in Dallas by a man whose name is peppered throughout the assassination literature, Thomas Beckham. Beckham is another low-level CIA contract agent who, by his own admission, worked with the CIA organ worked with the organization from 1959 until 1963. What he called the organization was actually a small CIA group of contractors organized by a man named Fred Lee Chrisman. Chrisman was most likely an actual employee of the CIA, not a contract agent, seeing as how his service went all the way back to World War II in the OSS. He called the group of many recruited and handled the organization, even though it was just his organization of recruits. He has his own Wikipedia page, which, is, which hilariously leaves out his connections to Clay Shaw and other players in the assassination story. His page reads as follows, quote, in 1946, Chrisman claimed to have battled with non-humans in caves during the Second World War. 
The following year, he attempted to convince two early flying saucer witnesses that lava rocks were in fact debris dropped from a flying saucer. In 1968, Chrisman was subpoenaed by a New Orleans grand jury in the prosecution of a man uh, for the assassination of President John Kennedy, a prosecution that would later be dramatized in the 1991 Oliver Stone film JFK. Chrisman functioned like any good handler does. He stayed in the shadows. He provided instruction and funds to Beckham and others prior to and after the assassination. He helped Beckham evade authorities after Kennedy was killed, and again once Garrison began his investigation. Chrisman was certainly a key figure in managing some of the personnel involved in the assassination. Beckham, like every other witness who worked with the CIA, is a liar. It is hard to tell which statements he made are truthful, exaggerations, or outright false. In his earliest testimony before the grand jury in the, Shea, in the Clay Shaw trial, he stated that he had never known Lee Harvey Oswald. When he testified before the HSCA, he claimed that he did know Oswald very well and that they had been good friends. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. His relationship with Oswald is largely irrelevant to me. Whether or not he was friends with Oswald plays no part in the aspect of his involvement in the assassination that I care about. What I do care about is the package he delivered to Lawrence Howard at the Executive Inn in Dallas a few weeks before the assassination. When it comes to witness statements and judging their veracity, I look for corroboration, which is often a hard thing to come by, or a logical placement in the storyline that I have been assembling. Beckham's testimony before the HSCA falls into the latter. I know with certainty that Lawrence Howard was one of the gunmen on the sixth floor of the book depository. I will cover that evidence later on. Knowing that Howard was a shooter, Beckham's testimony indicating that he delivered a package to him prior to the assassination fell completely in line with my overall thesis of the crime. Beckham was deposed by the HSCA in Jackson, Mississippi on October 9, 1977 by L.J. Delsa. Beckham was offered tentative immunity for his testimony. He didn't tell them the whole story, nor did he implicate himself in anything overly egregious, but nonetheless, he lied to them via omission. Beckham was certainly involved in the assassination planning and execution as he was photographed in Dallas on November 22nd at Love Field, walking a few feet from Kennedy's limo as it drove from the plane to the street. He never mentioned his uh, this to investigators. He told uh, the story that began with a meeting in Algiers, Louisiana. According to... Beckham, he attended a meeting with Sergio Arcacha Smith, G. Ray Gill, Vincent Marcello, Charlie Morello, Roswell Thompson, and a woman whose name was Anna, possibly Burglass. Also present were several unnamed Cubans. Beckham claimed that this meeting, discussions of the assassination of the president were conducted. He also attended meetings at the Town & Country Motel, which based on his tone, Beckham was unaware that the Town & Country was owned by Carlos Marcello. After these meetings took place, he was instructed by David Ferry to visit the office of G. Ray Gill. Upon arrival, Gill provided him with several photographs and documents, including sketches made of buildings and a street, presumably in the area of Dealey Plaza. He was also given $200 for payment. Beckham identified Roswell Thompson, Jack Martin, Clay Shaw, Mr. Marcello, and David Ferry as having been present at this meeting in Gill's office. Were all of these men really present? Don't know. Don't care. Gill was the connection to Marcello and thus all of the other players in the assassination, so whether or not they were president, present, this meeting is not overly relevant. Beckham was flown to Dallas, where he then was told to meet with a quote Mr. Howard. Lawrence Howard was the only Howard relevant in the assassination story, so we can rule out it having been anyone else. According to Beckham, he got into a car with Lawrence Howard and he handed him materials provided. He stated that Howard got mad, indicating that he expected a lot more than the few documents he was given. Is this? This can't be all. This can't be all it is, Howard inquired of Beckham. Beckham assured him it was. Beckham described the photographs as being of buildings and cars. He described with Howard a few blocks uh, before Howard pulled over, again double-checked the materials. Like hell, Howard proclaimed. That's all they gave me, Beckham replied. Beckham described the maps that were included as being hand-drawn diagrams. Beckham stated that after meeting with Howard, he returned to New Orleans and reported Howard's concerns to both Gill and Thompson, who told him they would handle it. Beckham's testimony then drifted to his relationship with Chrisman and how Chrisman helped him to move around, always one step ahead of investigators who were looking to interview him or serve him papers. Beckham's tale of meeting with Howard I find to be credible. He had been hiding the truth of his involvement in the assassination for almost 15 years, and having been offered immunity, I believe it was a burden he no longer wished to carry. All of the assassination debunkers who think Oswald acted alone like to say that someone would have talked if they had knowledge of the assassination. Thomas Beckham is a perfect example of how even when people do talk, no one seems to listen or believe them. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of 
Corey Hughes Bloody History. This was, again, a chapter from my upcoming book, which you can pre-order right now, and you'll get a copy of this chapter and three others. Um, you can get that from buymeacoffee.com slash jfkbook. And uh, all right, I got to go. I have a book to write, uh, which is what I'll be doing for the rest of the day. And uh, I will check in with you guys tomorrow. Thanks again.